Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and I am joined by my friend, my confidant. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but the one and only uh, Kyle Vukoskis of Hockey Night in Canada of Sportsnet. Uh, it's been really cool that you know you came on my my hundredth show, and it's been awesome getting to know you through the throughout the Sen season. We were just hanging out, I guess, uh, with Steve Steos and, and Linus Allmark, but. Um, yeah, just I'll, the four of us. Just the four of us. Yeah, what what a retreat. Um, well, I guess for you, like you know, you're in that grind of of a season. It's not exactly like you're putting your body on the line, like maybe uh, Leon Drysaitel and Connor McDavid. But I'm guessing for you, what's it like just to go through a Stanley Cup final and do game after game travel, like the whole shebang as a you know ringside reporter. Um, I, you say not putting my body on the line. I mean, have you ever taken an Uber with David Amber? Like the <laughs> size of those guys' shoulders. Do you think there's any room left for me to sit there <laughs> crushed up against the window? Um, uh, there's a lot of physical sacrifice over the course of the playoffs. Let me tell you, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, but it's the best time of year. So, um, it's just all, all fun. Um, and, and the final is, is great. I mean, uh, this past year, uh, exponentially so just to have a Canadian team in the mix and there's just an added element of of intrigue and the amount of people that are are paying close attention that maybe wouldn't otherwise if it was a, a US US matchup. Um so that that made it more fun. Um and I think uh I think as the years have gone on, you find different ways to try to uh help keep your energy up to to where it's where it needs to be. Um, whether it's, you know, putting an emphasis on, I don't know, going for a walk or some sort of exercise, um, you know, maybe picking your spots when to go for, you know, a, a post-game beverage or somewhere. But um, I just love during the final, like having all like the panels on the road, like there's just more um, of our colleagues there. Uh, it just, just adds to the, the whole uh, weight of, of each game and, and how much is, is at stake and, and the atmospheres in the buildings, of course, are, are at its peak. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot when, when you get through it, you're like, okay, you're ready for a breather. Um, but yeah, I, I would way rather be, be doing that than, uh, anything else right now. So, and yeah, last, last, uh, last spring was, was a real fun one. I, I guess you just needed to go to Vegas to unwind right after like a day after. Yes. Yeah. What a great way to do it. Just to, uh, <laughs> put your feet up. Um, as you know, in Vegas, uh, everything is really close by, um, the temperatures are very moderate, especially the end of June. Um, the sun is, you know, there, but not really a factor. Mm -hmm. um, it's quiet. Everything Much closes down on. early. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was, and then that was like uh, the the draft in Vegas was, man. Uh, How they cool! Was knocked it out of the park. I, I so we there was a group of us that went over the day before. There was doing a bit of a production rehearsal. Um, like Sam Constantino, Dave Amber, like Chuck Fletcher, mm -hmm. Jason Buchla, we all walked in through, come in on like the ground floor, got our credential and everything. Um, and then we like walked in the kind of right where like the draft floor is all the tables and stuff set up. And like all of us in unison, like looked up at the screen and like at once we're like, Whoa, <laughs> uh, it was, it was incredible, uh, to see it in person. And also like to then, how high up the seats go there. Like, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I still ahead. remember you. I think you're interviewing Flames fans. I, I could be mistaken, but yeah, yeah, super high up and just, and I'm like, I'd be a bit afraid. Like, do I, if I turn around too quickly, trip and <laughs> fall to my. Well, just... yeah, like, cause it's steep. It's steep up there um, compared to like your typical arena. Uh, so like, you've got to be careful. I imagine if you're there for a concert or something then, and, and you've had a few cocktails, like you've got to have your wits about you as you're going back down to your, your seats, if you're sitting up top there. Um, but it was just a, a really neat setup. I mean, the stage was a little bit tighter than, than in past years. Uh, but um, man, like I, I, I'll, I'll be, you know, really bummed as, as we move forward here. And if it does in fact become more of a, a hybrid model where uh, the teams are, are remote, um, because I just, I, I loved that that was so unique about the NHL and all the tables with the team logos all set up, um, everyone in, in one place. And I think for the fans too, I mean, it's such a joy for them if you're going to the draft and it's just hockey people everywhere you look throughout the city, like you're walking down the street to go for a bite to eat and there's, 
the general manager of the Minnesota wild. And then there's the head coach of the Florida Panthers. you know, like it's just, there's, there's faces that you recognize um, if you're a big hockey fan and they're, they're all in the same city with you. So uh, that sort of stuff, uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll all really miss. Um, but it was a, if that, that's how it ends up going, a great way to go out. Would you be uh, open to the sphere being almost like the mainstay for the draft for, for years to come kind of like in, the NBA it's in, it's in Brooklyn or New York. It has been the, the draft for a long time. Like I, I feel like it was, it went great. And on the TV mm. was awesome. There was plenty of memes with some of the reactions to players and the fans seem to be having a ball. Like, is, do you think there's any way that that can become a, a mainstay for the draft? I don't know. I, I cause I imagine it wasn't cheap. <laughs> uh, <Sure>. So <laughs> I, 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 I'm curious. Like I, 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 I also, I'm a big fan of, all right, like that, that went great. Like, okay, how can we be a little bit different the, the next time around? I think at least now that they've, they've opened the door to this after, you know, traditionally for a lot of years doing arenas, uh, their own arenas um, to go somewhere different here. And, and now maybe they get, you know, even more creative and, and mm-hmm. going somewhere that, that we haven't quite thought about yet. So either way, yeah, would happy, be happy to go, go back again um, or would we be happy to watch the draft from there again? Uh, but if it's somewhere else that, that the NHL hasn't been before, uh, you know, I, I love the, the innovation side of it too. Hmm. Maybe going back a little bit to, to last year, was there a moment throughout the playoff run that kind of sticks out in your mind when you look back at the 2024 playoffs and, and the Oilers almost coming back and their run and obviously Florida being so dominant throughout the whole playoffs as well? Yeah, it was, um, I mean, the the atmosphere in game six there in Edmonton. I mean, each, each game, I did the third round when they played Dallas and then the final, but um, that one in particular, because of everything surrounding it, right. I mean, the chance to force a game seven Oilers fans knew win or lose. This was the last time they were seeing them on, on, in their building. Um, that was a energy and electricity that I'll never forget. And the fact that, um, you know, turned in into a bit of a blowout, not game four blowout, but you kind of felt pretty early on in the night uh, which way this was was going to go. That sort of stuff sticks with you, and uh, just incredible. The, you know, the fans when you would go to leave the building because we would walk back to our hotel afterwards, um, and just the the mood that everybody was in. You know, I felt that when they knocked off Dallas, of course, to to get to the final, um, and then certainly that night as well. Um, you just it's it's really it's a really neat scene to just kind of get caught up in and look around and think like man this is this is really cool right especially that city had, had waited a while for uh, a chance to be that that close to a Stanley Cup again um, it was all just really really wonderful memories so uh, that sticks out you know getting a chance to catch up with a uh, friend of the show Charles Barkley again was <laughs> was a lot of fun um, I actually talked to. Uh, met Travis Kelsey briefly in Dallas during the third round. That was a real highlight. Yeah. Um, would have loved to interview him. He, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't into doing anything on camera that night, which is totally understandable. But um, I don't know if you listened to uh, you know, his podcast with his yeah, brother, nice. new heights. I, I've, I caught a few episodes. Like I, I don't see it every or listen to it every week. Um, but uh, they interviewed Andrew Santino. Like it would have been just before, like I was down there and all of a sudden he's at the game. Uh, and I'm a big fan of his, like, I love watching Dave. He does a great, did a great job on that show. Um, so, and I'm usually not one to do this. Like typically my shy nature, uh, <laughs> kind of takes over, yeah. but I'm standing in like the suite that he was in. Cause we were waiting to interview Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, yep. so he was also in the same suite. So I'm kind of standing there like fish out of water going like, I shouldn't be here, but we were just waiting for DeChambeau to show up. So I'm just trying to stay out of everybody's way. Uh, but at one point, like we just kind of made eye contact and he gives, you know, the, the smile and nod kind of thing. And I'm like, screw it. I'm going for it. So I just said, Hey, I don't want to bother you. I just said, I really enjoyed, you know, your interview with, uh, Santino there not too long ago. Um, you know, that was a real, real, really enjoyed listening to it. He's like, Oh my man, thank you. Like daps me up. I'm like, Holy Jesus. Uh, he's like, he's like, yeah. He goes, he's the man. He goes, you know him at all? I'm like, no, no, I don't know him at all. I got just, just a fan. (laughs) (laughs) um and anyway and then at that point of course like you know quit while you're ahead don't prolong the conversation any more than you need to before it goes south i just said you know i don't want to interrupt your night but just wanted to to say that and uh you know i just just said congrats with you know everything um he's like oh thank thank you very much thank you but just really gracious and then it was hilarious watching him 
watch the game. Like he was like, because <laughs> typically, it. like those guys, you know, they show up there, they're in a suite, right? It's so easy to be caught up without other distractions in there. You're talking to people, you're not really paying attention yep. to the game as much. Um, Kelsey was like jumping around, like hitting his buddies <laughs> on the shoulder, like anytime there was a chance or like a big hit. Uh, he was locked into it, right? Like, I know he played a bit of hockey uh, yeah. growing up, um, but he was he was totally all in on well the stars that night. Um, he was he was right there, so that was cool to watch. You know, all the Swifties that love this show just love that you were you know a couple degrees of separation from Taylor Swift. So I had I had to mention that. <laughs> right, I'm yes. kidding. I'm kidding. But yes. uh, <laughs> is that was that one of the can kind of the moments for you where you're you know as you said a little bit starstruck like I know we talked about this before but you know being in the public eye meeting so many people especially in the hockey world but just in general like is there do you does it become more natural to you or it's like oh that's just Wayne Gretzky whatever you know maybe maybe you don't think it that dramatically but just in terms of you it kind of becomes numb or do you still have all these like pinch me moments with with your job um yeah, I think certainly internally, and it's more so like the the players that I like would have grown up watching. Um, certainly when I was like really young, when like you see them as these larger than life people. Um, and that kind of always sticks with you as, as you grow up and you think back to watching these players at their heights of their careers. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of that. And then, yeah, with, with Kelsey, I mean, I just, as I say, like, typically I'm a, I'm a shy person. Like I, I wouldn't have said anything, but I don't know what came over me then where I just thought oh, I'm going to go for it, I guess, because of how inviting he seemed. Um, so, uh, but it was one of those where at the time you're like, you're just talking to the guy. And mm -hmm. then I remember afterwards, like calling my wife and I mean, like, you'll never guess what happened. Like that was <laughs> like, that was like really cool. Um, so little stuff like that, but in terms of, you know, star, starstruck, I, I mean, you you clearly, you mm -hmm. respect, uh, what other athletes or, uh, people in the, the public eye have, have accomplished, but, uh, yeah, the other one, I mean, the, we've talked about like Paul Carrillo is my favorite player and, mm -hmm. um, remember I, I got to meet him years ago, uh, in, in California through Jason York, him and I both worked on the, the Canadians broadcasts back then and uh their buddies right because they were teammates in anaheim for a little bit and still kept in touch so they went and for dinner that night and uh jason said come by afterwards and and did the guy just meet him like that was like wow uh hmm. because i i grew up everything hockey wise was was about him uh hmm. war number nine because of him he was you know, he was drafted the year I was born. He retired the year I graduated high school. Like the true wow. definition of like <laughs> childhood hero, you know? Yeah. Um, and he still looks fantastic. Like he could still play. Yeah. But uh, yeah. 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 So that was, that was one. If you think of now, like in the years that I've been working in this business, that was the one where that was starstruck. You know, I always marvel looking at you and, and, and covering like the Stanley Cup finals because I know me, if I was in your position and I was, you know, the first person to interview the the cup champs right after I'd be, you know, nervous as a rock. Like, how do you go through it, have all your questions prepared? Like in that moment, does it like I'm, I'm not saying it feels like any random game in Ottawa, um, but does it what's that kind of preparation like for you just, you know, for the finals? Is it any different? Is there anything, any other pressure? Just kind of walk us through the your kind of work process for that. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of work, like as soon as like the way I do it and I don't know how others in the past or what the right way is to do it. And I'm certainly not suggesting this is, um, but typically, you know, when, when a team gets to, to three wins, then, okay, now that they're one win away. So I, I dive into, uh, I go through basically the, the whole team effectively, like everyone, you think there's a chance, you know, we could, we could interview and coaches and if, you know, the GM, um, and I just spend time going through and just trying to find uh, little nuggets that may be worth bringing up in the interview um, just, just to be prepared. And so maybe that, that helps with staying calm in the moment because I've done the work beforehand and uh, I've got that to, to fall back on. But I mean, at least when, you know, typically the first few guys, like it's just the emotion is so raw. Um, you're just, 
you're having them describe what they're feeling like you're very much in the moment as opposed to you know when you were 12 years old you went and you said you were gonna you told your dad you you know i don't know like there's yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff that, that that maybe later on in in the night as, as it's kind of sunk in and the cup's been handed out and um just the the state of the player is, is a little bit different than like you know five minutes after the horn sounds um then that's when you typically kind of maybe I'll, I'll work some of that stuff in but um yeah it is it is i i kind of lock go into witness protection and uh lock myself in my hotel room and just gotta grind through it all because you want to be prepared and um be able to to do the players justice you know getting uh a chance to speak their mind at the the height of their careers and uh yeah you just want to make sure you're you're ready for it all so uh mm -hmm. Did you make sure that Paul Maurice shouted out the Winnipeg Jets when he had that, you know? Or... I, I didn't make sure I got that. No, I, as they say, I, I, I just had to stand there with the microphone. Like, that was almost, I didn't need to do any prep for that. Like, it was just, you let him go. So it was, uh, it was, that, that was, that was a neat one. It was just, again, you, you totally got a sense of how much that, that meant to him and how long he's been in the game. You know, I mean, got kind of close with Carolina in 02, but, Let's face it; it was it would have been something if they had beat that Detroit team. Um, ran out of gas a year ago and almost had it slip through their fingers last year, um, but finally got it done. So, yeah, I was was happy for him and and just hey, he had been he had so many great sound bites all throughout the playoffs and the one before that too, um, and then continued to have more great ones at the parade with the shirt with his yeah. cats on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just a just a gem of a man. So it was it was neat to to be able to stand there next to him as he was letting it all out. Well, you know, from, from last season to this season, there's been a lot of, you know, some tragedy obviously in the hockey world as well, but a lot of news, um, you know, just uh, earlier, uh, Leon Dreisaitl signed a, you know, eight year extension. I just want to know, like watching him up close, like, and, and seeing him making, you know, a lot, a lot of money, $14 million a year. Um, how is this, does it, it feels like this is a, a, a a deal that really benefits both sides of, of, you know, the Oilers and, and Dreisaitl. And um, what do you think this maybe means for the Oilers moving forward with, with him locked up for, for nine years now? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's a great sign for Edmonton to try to keep this window open as long as they possibly can to, to finish the job, right. That they got so close to, to doing. Um, I mean, there's no, I know when he was asked about it yesterday, he's going, Hey, I, I'm just worried about me. I mean, Connor's going to do, his thing when when the time comes for for him to sign his next deal which absolutely of, of course that's what you're going to say but like there's no question the relationship between the two how close they've become how they've been attached at the the hip uh for so many years um you know that that, that only bodes well the fact that he's re up for the long haul um that their captain's gonna gonna likely follow suit here right like so long as they believe they have a chance to win in edmonton um you know, I think they're, they're going to, it seems like they're going to continue to to stay there. We know Leon is. Uh, so I, I just believe, and I'm sure they know, um, you know, one of the better chances that they do have is if they're continuing to, to play together. Um, of course, I think they've learned over time and Leon even touched on it the other day about how it can't just be a, a two man team, right? You, you need to have quality depth around you. Um, and I think they've, the, the organization has, has gone through learning that as, as well. And, They've done a better job at uh, at surrounding them with with the necessary support that that they need, and um, you know having good goaltending. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in in Stuart Skinner, and and he certainly had his moments of brilliance over over their their run, along with some tough times as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a it's a great thing. Um, you know, like here he he could have wrote his own ticket and and had blank checks issued to him from everywhere if he wanted to. Um, but he chose to to stay in Edmonton. So great, great for the market. Uh, great for him getting, you know, what, what stands at least for now, at least for one more year, um, the biggest contract in, in NHL history. Um, yeah. And I, I think he's, he's, he's worth every penny with, with how, how good of a player he can be when, when he's at his peak. Um, I didn't probably have the Stanley cup final that he wanted to have. Um, but, but nevertheless, I think, you know, we're still, very much in the the prime years of of Leon Draisaitl, and I really liked what he said. That uh, you know, he's asked about you know the pressure now of signing this big deal, and he was like, "I don't look at it as pressure. 
it's more of a responsibility. Like, and mm-hmm. I, I really like the way he framed it, um, right. saying that like understands obviously the ownership, how much money they're paying him, um, and how much this all means to the community. The fact that he's staying and their desire to have a winner. Um, I just, I really like that that answer from him, and I think speaks volumes to kind of how he approached this whole negotiation and ultimately deciding to to stay with the Oilers. With that, you know, maybe the responsibility for him and and, and McDavid is to bring the the cup back home to to Edmonton, and they were obviously so close last year, or I guess this year, but um, in the playoffs. But for you, what's that maybe missing? You know, that they lost Broberg and, and Holloway, obviously, to the offer sheets. And that might be another topic for another day um, in terms of how that might change the landscape of how RFAs are in this in this league. But in terms of the team, do you think it's better than it was, you know, in the playoffs last year? What What's that maybe missing piece that they need to, to add or that they maybe already have to, to get over the hump next season? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard to say, like, when you're two goals away from winning the Stanley Cup to say, like, well, there's there's this piece that they were missing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you're you're so close to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's a tough reality is that you work just as hard as the Panthers did. You wanted it just as bad as them, but you get nothing at the end of the day. Um, I, I really like that, uh, you know, I, I think, as I said, as they've gotten more depth, uh, I mean, the – the Zach Hyman deal has turned out to be a franchise changer for them. Um, just incredible. The impact that he has, uh, especially again, into the playoffs too, into the Stanley cup final, like the, the way he touched the game uh, really fascinating to watch. Um, you know, I bring back a guy uh, like Connor Brown, who, I mean, talked about struggled out of the gate, I think because he was still dealing with, you know, lingering issues from what kept him out basically the entire season prior you could see him start to find his groove in the playoffs. Um, and you just, for him, you hope that it continues to, uh, to, to grow and, and his comfort level there and, and confidence to, to make plays and, and to be an impact in a contributing way a little more often. I just thought, you know, we were talking about it earlier, Alex, like the fact that Evander Kane wasn't a hundred percent as the playoffs wore on. Um, and, and miss some games in the final there because of, of his health, um, just to have that little extra weapon offensively um, certainly certainly hurt. Um, I know defensively they're a team that's been uh, kind of had that, that notion that, that they're not great in that area for years past, but um, I thought there was incredible growth in, in that regard over the playoffs. I mean, of course, I think of Philip Roberg being the one that, um, you know, grew a, grew a lot and learned a lot in a short period, and he's not there anymore. But um, you know, you think about the player that Evan Bouchard's becoming and uh, going through the lineup. I think there's there's still a lot there um, for this group to to think, hey, we can we can be back there and and to try to uh, rewrite the ending. Were you surprised that they didn't match the the offer sheets for for Broberg and Holloway because they they would have been in cap purgatory if if they had even for one of them? Yeah, I, I guess. I wondered about Holloway because, you know, the number was, you know, considerably less compared to what you know, the one that Broberg signed. Um, and I thought that maybe they, they viewed him as, as a, as a middle six piece that, um, that they, they valued going forward, just given how early he is still in, in his career. Um, so that was one I, I thought uh, they were, they were going to bite on and, and then just figure out the, the cap situation from there, right? You, you decide, Hey, this is a player that we need and, and we'll deal with the rest afterwards. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's also a, a good insight to kind of where the management is at right now and going, okay, if you guys want to with those numbers, we'll take the draft picks and we'll also take the, the cap spaces, as you say, right? Like there's, there is something to be said for being able to accrue cap space over the year to give them some more flexibility come trade deadline time or other points in the year to, to make your team a little bit better. Um, you know, I think you saw uh, like Florida being able to bring in Vladimir Tarasenko and, you know, it seemed like it was like one goal, a series, right. That was, yeah. was very impactful and timely. Um, and, and that makes a huge difference. Um, so I, I think that's to, to, to see their thinking on, on that front um, was intriguing to me. Um, but, you know, it, yeah, it's, it is like, there's, there's always that feeling of, the premium on, on young players that you think have potential. It's not easy to let them go, but 
um, clearly, you know, the, the upside to having a bit more flexibility um, was enough for them to be able to, to say goodbye and good luck. I guess with that moving from from a team that's had success in the playoffs, I, I want to go to the Leafs, uh, who you've obviously uh, covered for, for many years and, and been at a lot of their playoff failures. I think almost all of them of late. But for you, were you surprised that, you know, the mantle has been passed from from John Tavares to Austin Matthews, you know, in terms of the captaincy? And, and how does that, you think, maybe affect Matthews' game, the, the, the team on the ice, and maybe... Maybe does it change the outcome in your mind a little bit where this team might be, you know, like how much does a captain being the captain really mean in today's NHL in your mind, Kyle? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, that, that one a little tougher for me to answer just cause I'm, I'm, I'm not in the room. Right. So hmm. uh, I, I won't pretend to, to know truly how valuable it, it is, but uh, was I surprised? No, I can't only because, I mean, I remember hearing some rumblings quietly, like shortly after, they were knocked out by Boston in, in the spring that that was something that they would potentially be considering. Um, so, and I, and I don't believe, you know, of course, you know, if you're John Tavares and you're told, Hey, look, we, we want to make a, a change uh, on the captaincy front. Um, it can't be the greatest feeling in the world, but I, I think he is a professional um, clearly, you know, is, is supporting Austin in, in this when, when they had their, their press conference announcing uh, the, the change so I think there's going to be no issue there. And I, I don't think, you know, there's, well, what is this, you know, does, does, how does this change Austin's approach? And they, I don't think it changes it a bit for him. Like he, mm. he has his way of going about it. Um, you, know, you hear all the time from teammates about how much work he puts in behind the scenes, how he prepares himself. Um, and you see publicly how he carries himself in the media, um, you know, in and around kind of the market there um, that can be demanding at times. Um, he's, he's got to figure it out. I give him a lot of credit. And, and now just because he's the captain, I don't think any of that will, will change in, in any way. Um, so I, I think, will that mean, you know, now a different outcome in the playoffs? I, I'm not sure one directly relates to another, but, um, you know, certainly for players in the room, like, you, you know, regardless of where the letters sit, who the leaders are and, uh, who, who, whose voice and, um, way they go about things that you you tend to to follow there so i think uh he's he's becoming more and more of that guy over the, the last few seasons you hear about oh he's you know more vocal than he was in years past um and you just see the way he, he can command certain situations um it seemed like it was only a matter of time mm -hmm. i'll just call him captain poppy now uh there you go. <laughs> obviously uh the other you know big part of the off season or or maybe lack of movement has been the the Mitch Marner situation uh, you know you've been around the team as I said before a lot um, how much do you think going into to the final year of his contract the the media pressures of Toronto like how does this end well I, I I'm just thinking to myself Kyle like how does this work out for the Leafs for Marner it just feels like maybe you know a time for divorce but I don't know I you know they've they've re-upped Nylander Obviously, they re-up Matthews. It looks like they probably will with Tavares. Like, what do you think will happen with Marner this season in terms of his prospects to to stay with this team long term? Yeah, man, I I, I don't know either. Like, I I was thinking something was going to happen this summer. Um, just in my own mind, like I, I didn't have you know per se any intel into it all. Um, but you know, now I, I'm just really curious to see how they play this. You know, because you know that's going to be the number one topic on the opening day of training camp. Um, and then, you know, if for whatever reason, whether things get off to a slow start for the team or for, for him personally, like the heat's only going to go up. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I wonder then what what do you do? You know, I mean, hopefully for, for Mitch's sake and, and the team's sake, that, that that's not the case. Like, um, you know, you, you see at times uh, over the years clearly where, um, you know, the, the extra attention around whatever it may be, um, hasn't always been the, brought the best out of him. Um, like you just hope the, the kid is happy and, and can play free because when he does, it's, it's really entertaining to watch. Um, so however this goes, um, you know, hopefully 
their the ultimate resolution is is something that that both teams can can or both sides I should say uh, can walk away from whether they continue to to be married together or or not for the the long haul um, that they they can say hey we we gave it our, our best shot and and it, it was just uh, whether we're continuing this we gave it our best shot and we think yes it can work or we gave it our best shot and think hey it's best for both parties to go separate ways um, like you just don't want it to to turn ugly right because yeah. um, that's no fun for anybody and and as you know in, in that market if if it does um, it'll be ratcheted up a, a few more notches than than in most places uh, so I'm yeah I'm as curious as any to see where it goes because um, you know, I think you're leaving a lot of variables out there going into the year in, in this state um, and and a lot of the I think early results will will dictate kind of how things go yeah. from there. How did you like the off season for the Leafs? Like, you know, outside of, you know, maybe inaction with, with Marner and, 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 and obviously the captaincy with, with Matthews, do you, do you think this team is markedly better than it, they were going into the playoffs last year? Where do you see this Leafs team in the, the kind of the, on the playoff front? Yeah. I, I mean, I think they're I've like clearly a per, perennial playoff team and I don't think there's anything that's, that's happened where you suggest, oh man, have they taken themselves out of that conversation and, I don't think there's been quite enough even around their own division where you think, oh, there's a number of teams that could really challenge them now for, for at least one of the top three spots. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't mind kind of how they've, they've kind of reshaped their, their defense. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big Joseph wall guy, uh, but you know, the, the, the health is, is a big question. Um, so I wonder what, like what kind of opportunity like Anthony Stolarz is, is going to get um, he's a, huge guy by the way like i uh one thing being around the the panthers and just like big like thick shoulders thick back and all that like he is uh he's a large large human like he he takes up a lot of net um but but i think you know moves quite well for for a guy his size and so you know how much action is is he gonna get over the course of the year that'll be something to to keep an eye on as as it always is um Mm -hmm. but I think they're, yeah, they're, they're once again, a team that, that should be right in the, the conversation. Um, especially, yeah, as you've got Austin Matthews and, and William Nylander still, and now, you know, Matthew Nye is one year older, re-upping with Max Domi. Uh, we'll see what happens, you know, with, with Mitch Marner. Um, but with all those players still very, you know, just in the thick of the prime of their career or just kind of still entering the prime of, of their careers, um, they're very much you, you've you've got to do what you can to to win, um, and now that with the addition of you know Craig Berube behind the bench, how he's going to put his stamp on things. Like I'm always curious about that, right? Because yeah. these guys have been playing together for a long time now. Like you, you kind of you know what they are as players and what their strengths are. Um, like how much of a difference can a new head coach really make? Like I remember when Rod Brindamore first got hired in Carolina, he was saying like for the most part across the league, like a lot of us teams are doing the same thing in terms of systems. And at least we all know what we're all doing. There's not a lot of secrets out there. So as a coach, it's like, you're really, you're managing people, right? Like how are you getting the most out of these individuals? Uh, So I'd be wonder how he's going to go about doing that in a, in a market like Toronto. Hmm. I want to transition as as best I can to, you know, uh, the senators. And we were there just, you know, earlier today, seeing Steve Steos, Linus Allmark, um, does it, does it feel different, you know, it, with this team, they've obviously really come out the, out of the gates so slowly, really the past you know five, six years. And, mm. um, last year was such a disappointment just with, you know, the expectations to finally to break into the playoffs. Um, where do you see this team in terms of the playoff picture and, and how would you maybe, you know, uh, assess Steve Steos off season? Yeah, I think I give him credit for like clearly what he wanted to do, getting it done fairly early in in the game and and not waiting. Um, you know, coming right out with making the the Chikrin trade, um, you know, signing David Perron, getting uh, Shane Pinto re up. You know, the next day, obviously the Allmark trade coming a little bit before that. Um, I mean, there's the Cousins deal that comes you know later on in, in the off season, um, but adding, you know, a bit more edge to the lineup there. I don't know. It's tough to really say, like, for a team that's missed the playoffs seven straight years, like, it's hard to say, like, oh, yeah, these guys are bonafide playoff team. Like, until you see it, um, it's 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 hard to say yes. But 
it's interesting like every year now as they're trying to be like i feel they've almost been stuck in neutral for like three years right mm -hmm. i mean certainly last year it felt like a step back for a whole host of reasons but um it's been a similar kind of overarching messaging going in where it's like it's time for this group to take the next step and to hold each other accountable and this is it's not so much that they're a young team anymore they've been around long enough um, like you hear that a lot at this time of year, the last couple I've found. Um, but now like the terminology that they're using, right? Like it was in the past, it was, well, we don't want to put any expectations on anything. We're just trying to, you know, we want to play meaningful games for a while. And then it was, you know, we're just worried about the expectations we have on the inside. And now I heard Brady Kachuk say in interviews over the summer, and we heard Steve say again uh, today about, it's just about, you know, kind of winning our day. And we're worried about, doing that again the next day, like being very short-term goal oriented. And then the long-term kind of takes care of itself. So mm -hmm. um, they've, they've gone through the, uh, the whole list of, of, uh, of terminology when it comes to, to this stuff and, and buzzwords, which, which is good. I just like that. I mean, at least there's some quiet now, you know, yeah. like there isn't any stuff about the sale, about, you know, the Shane Pinto situation last year, the Evgeny Dadanov, no trade uh, hoopla around it all. Like, you know, at least for now, none of that is is going on. Um, so at least you're, everyone's in place. Uh, as Theo said, you know, feet are under us. And, and now, you know, you, you're giving yourself every opportunity and, and every reason to, to get off to a, a decent start. And now we'll see if, if they can do it. If, if Allmark is in a success here, do we just give up on having good goaltenders in Ottawa? And it's it like, <laughs> I guess that's my best segue to just the Allmark acquisition and how much maybe goaltending and having finally a, a solid goaltending might be the impetus for this team to finally, I don't know if it'll make them make the playoffs, but be in that real contention for the playoffs. Right. And how they defend in front of them too, you know, right. Cause I mean, as, as tough as the goaltending was for, for large stretches of last year, like there are also nights where you're going, well, what else were they supposed to do? Like they just great a chance, great a chance in the slot, like just prime scoring opportunities that were being given up. Um, you know, it would be tough for, for any goalie to have a good save percentage at, at the end of some of those nights last year. So I think now, I mean, clearly you have him there and, and I'm sure it makes everybody a little bit taller um, in, in the room, which, which is a, can be a very dangerous thing in in a good way. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I love his attitude and, and his personality and, and even like, I mean, you go back when he first came into the league and he talked about, you know, those tough years in Buffalo where they weren't anywhere close to the playoffs, but well. his numbers were more than respectable for a team that was not very good. Um, and so you can see why, you know, three years ago, Boston went, yeah, I think we will give this guy a shot here. Um, and, and then he, he took off, took off from there and, and has a Vezina trophy to his name. So I think, uh, the fact that he went through that time with the Bruins and, um, you know, I hear a lot about kind of that, that Bruin way and, and how they operate, um, being able to, to bring a little bit of that here, um, cause he's seen what, what a winning program and environment looks like. Um, and I'm sure, you know, uh, everyone else in, in that room, you know, wants to, wants to create you know something similar here in in ottawa so uh, what a great asset to to have and the fact that he's a, a quality goaltender only is uh, is icing on the cake so um yeah you know if he's anything close to what he's been in in boston the last few years um man a total game changer for the sense for sure just i'm just happy they a quality quote over anything no <laughs> <laughs> yes yes exactly yeah it's funny what happened in the goalie situation here in this town because for years it was the all right the from Laleem to I mean even you know Tugnut and yeah. Barrasso and Hashik for a brief Close. period and Emery. Uh, Craig Anderson right even, yeah Ray Emery and, and Craig Anderson of course had a long run of just you can count on him when when it was needed most um other than the occasional goal you give up from like behind the goal line but or uh, he'd come out of his net I still remember against Boston in 2017 him coming out of his net and just, oh yeah it was just a pile i, I forget who yeah. i think marshan scored it was uh it's not not fun not fun yeah right right but but otherwise you know someone you can count on you know uh but yeah since since then it's been it's been a bit of a grind do, do you th how much do you think maybe with the 
a new coach and it, kind of similar on the the Berube from you know from Keith point where a new coach comes in uh, many people in the fan base uh, you know were pretty ready for for a new voice um, the team seemed to always sputter in the big moments like how much is you know coaching just that possibility that a, a new coach the new coach bump gets that team from you know underperforming to overachieving yeah I, I think or even at least yeah playing a little closer to their their potential um yeah i, I think again if you have the right person it can go it can go a long way because i mean sometimes you see it that that new coach bump doesn't always work out r right away but um yeah I, I think again here in ottawa it wasn't the case that you know, the, the players had turned on DJ and were not tooting him out or anything. I think there was always a, a great deal of respect and just the, the story of, you know, the day he was let go and he goes to a watering hole near the hotel or wherever they were, they Denver or Arizona yeah. and, uh, and all the players coming by to, um, yeah. you know, have a, have a soda with him and, and thank him for, for his years there speaks volumes to the lasting respect that he'll have. But, um, you know, they clearly it was just time for, for a new voice and, um, yeah, I, I've gotten to know Travis a little bit just when he was in, in Vancouver there and, and covering some Vancouver games. So, uh, I, I've, I've got a lot of time for him and, um, appreciate the way he, he goes about things. Um, I, I, I have to laugh at how much attention this whole tough training camp, uh, yes. idea is, is getting right. And uh, just the, the fiery quotes and saying, you know, guys got to come to camp in shape, like find me a coach. That's like, don't worry about coming to camp in shape. Like that's. That's what the first month of the year is for, you know, like nobody thinks that way anymore. So um, I, I imagine he'll have some, some hard skates that'll get the, the lungs going. Um, but, but other than that, right. Like he, he knows as well as any, like he, you need to have your team in a position that can sustain, you know, the energy that's required over 82 games over a long season. So definitely not going to try to burn everybody out off the, off the hop, but um, it's uh I think it's the, the right time for, for someone like him to, to come in. And, and I can only imagine how much he learned from his time with the Canucks and, and even a little bit there with, with New Jersey as they were going through a very tough year, how to handle certain situations as a coach. Um, I think it could be a, a nice partnership there with, with a group of players that, um, you know, have a lot of potential, but I think have, have realized, you know, where, where their faults have lied throughout these last few years as well, where they've, uh, failed to kind of get to that next level that they were hoping to. I, I guess with that, like, where does this team go if they are to to fail and 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 maybe not make the playoffs, have an underwhelming season? Like, it, it feels mm -hmm. as though this. I mean, every year it feels like in Sens land, kind of like the Leafs, where it's like this is the year and it's gone, right? Right. But, um, with that, what what's the direction of this team if they don't take at least some sort of jump and, and into the playoffs or at least very close to it like what happens it is it it feels as though this is a pretty big turning point year for this team yeah i would say for sure and i i'm i'm not terribly interested in in playing the, the hypothetical game i kind of cross that bridge when when we come to it but i mean let's face it there's a new ownership group in um they just made a bunch of changes to their front office. So we've got a new coaching staff in now. Um, you know, I think now if, if it continues to be an issue, like do you start to take a deeper look at, uh, at the current roster and, um, you know, some of the players that maybe you thought were uh, key pieces to the, the long-term success of, of the franchise, um, maybe you start to feel differently about them. But as I say, like until we get there, it's, it's hard to really know for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and you know, if, if that ends up being the case, how did they get there? What, what the key issues were, um, will dictate a lot of it, but, um, yeah, I, but I, I, I would, I would agree with you and that, you know, I don't think there's, um, there's really no, no excuse this year to, to, to not be able to, whatever that ends up being at the end of the year, say we are in a much better place than we were 365 days prior. Right. I think there's, there isn't, uh, there's no more outs anymore for, for them. Um, which is good. Like seven years is a long time. Like I, again, I think about okay. how bad this franchise was coming back into the league in 92. Um, they didn't go this long before making the playoffs. Uh, so the fact that it's been this long for this, this current group, like I, I really, I sympathize with, with the fan base where they're going like, come on enough already. Uh, they have every right to feel that way. Do we just believe in the Ian Mendez, you know, whenever he works for the Sens, they make the playoffs. Is that, 
Is that what we <laughs> Yes, that's right. That's right, right. I don't think they haven't missed since he's been a, a member of the organization, right? So yeah, uh, that that's he's he's the reverse kryptonite for for the for the sins. Um yeah. before I let you go and you know, there's no easy way to to talk about it, but I th I think it'd be important, you know, uh, I know you obviously covered the Flames for a long time or in terms of just like being on hockey night in Canada and obviously just such a tragedy with with Johnny Hockey and Johnny Gaudreau and his brother. I just is there any kind of memories that you have from, you know, covering him or anything that you'd maybe want to share about Johnny um, you know, being around him a little bit. Yeah, it, it was uh gosh, it, it what a Ugh. terrible terrible situation. Like it just brutal in every sense and terribly unfair um how it all played out, but um I mean, I yeah, I, I didn't spend a ton of time around him because he was in Calgary and I, I typically, you know, worked out of, out of the East, but I remember my, like my first year working, you know, more so on, on the NHL side and, and doing broadcasts. One of my first assignments was covering the team North America training mm -hmm. camp before the world cup. Um, so it started in Montreal and then they went up and played an exhibition game in Quebec city and then played another one in Montreal and then covered them primarily for the actual tournament itself. Um, so I just, I remember like one of their first practices because, you know, going in, there was a thought of this is a gimmick and yeah. how are all these kids going to be able to, to do know, it. hang it with, with, you know, the top international teams in, in the world. And like, you know, they're running their first time going through power play touches and, you know, he's on a half wall of that first unit and watching those guys snap it around. I just remember thinking like, Oh shoot. Like, did we, we may have not have fully thought this thing through. These guys might actually be okay. Um, and, and as I say, I, I was still very early in, in my time, you know, working on a broadcast in that capacity and doing, you know, intermission interviews and things like that. Um, and, and anytime you know, we asked for him, he was incredibly gracious and uh, gave thoughtful answers and um, respectful. And, and I, appreciated that just given you know i would just started and you know nobody knew me from from a can of paint at, at that time and, and that's still very much be the case uh might, might be the case but um you know, i just sort of like i know like ryan leslie uh colleague out of calgary there um knew him quite well thought the world of him always spoke very highly of him um i know that like uh, the day after uh, the news all came out that that him and matthew uh tragically had perished um he was on central with martin guyard and told just a wonderful you know anecdotal story about um a special thing that that johnny and his wife meredith did uh for for ryan's daughter on on her her 13th birthday um i just mm -hmm. uh, thought that that really gave uh gave some insight into the type of a person he was beyond just how brilliant of a hockey player he was too so um yeah just uh, unfortunately you know a reminder of how delicate like this whole thing is um and you just think of something like that and how easily avoidable that all should have been but uh mm -hmm. wasn't because of some incredibly poor decision making um yeah it just it sucks mm -hmm. well you said that so poetically and, and effortlessly and i appreciate you i know it's not the easiest topic but i i know you, you, you shared it and um, I guess, you know, maybe to to go from, you know, the somberness of that to something a bit more, um, you know, playful and, and joyful to to end this podcast. For you, just with, you know, your time in the league, um, do you have to get ready for training camp? Do you need to get in, you know, training camp shape, the hair, the stylist? <laughs> what's that like for you to, you know, go from, you know, working your way up in September, the off season, just to get prepared for a 82 game grind. Yeah. I mean, uh, Barry, our, our dog here and I, we, we play a lot of, uh, keep away with the mini stick and a tennis ball down in the basement here. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the extent of my, my off season training before camp is to make sure that the hands are dialed and stuff like that. Um, uh, no, but I mean, I will say like in the summertime, like after free agency, like I, I like, just not having to, to think about hockey and it's mm -hmm. not that like I'm sick of it or anything or I don't, oh. you know, I don't enjoy it anymore. It's not like that, but it's just, you, you know, you, you want to think yeah. about other, other things, right. Cause you're so immersed in it for so long. It's good to, to, to go somewhere, let your mind go somewhere else. So 
honestly, the, yeah, the lead up is just kind of reminding myself of what all went on in the off season um, and how, you know, seasons ended for, for certain teams and uh, just a, a refresher of, of kind of where, where things are at around the league before, before things get, get going. But um, yeah, having a bit of time to, to decompress at least you know, gets you excited again about uh, getting back into the, the swing of things. So it always comes, uh, comes quick. Um, but, but when it, once it's here, it's like, all right, we're ready to go. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Do you just have like the, the same imprint of the Leafs losing in game seven to Boston? So you're like, okay, I don't need to remember. I, it's every year. I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, there's that. And yeah, there's, there's always <laughs> lots of, lots of images from certainly the playoffs, right. That are mm -hmm. in, in, imprinted in your, in your brain that, that aren't, aren't going anywhere as much as you, you try to um, not think about things. They're, oh. they're always hanging around not too oh. far away. I'll definitely always think about you interviewing uh, Connor McDavid after, you know, winning the, uh, what, I, what, what is it? The Prince of Wales. What's the conference trophy? I forget what it's called for the West. The Campbell. Campbell. Um, Campbell. Yeah. And he was very, you know, open and honest. So I, I always remember that with the, the orange beard uh, in the blue uh, with all the crowd just, you know, yelling and screaming and, and just ecstatic. So I'll remember that from, yeah. from last year. That was loud. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, uh, not that I have a, uh, anyone in, in the game, but uh, it'd be cool to, to see you maybe do that interview next year in maybe game five or six so that you have, you know, some time with your wife um, but, <laughs> with Connor McDavid and, and, and this time the Stanley Cup. But uh, Kyle, thanks so much for, for taking the time and doing this. Uh, I know, uh, you know, you've been so incredibly kind to me with the Senators and covering them. And I appreciate you coming on this little dinky podcast uh you know you know i guess hey come on now so this is what my third time on third time on baby oh, yeah, man. Yeah. over halfway to the five timers club i know you're you're almost there almost there yeah. we, need, we need a we need the sense playoff run to make it get get closer to five that's what we need that's what there we need. you go there you go all right well we'll see if it happens this year well, thanks man i uh very very uh kind of you to say but yeah pleasure uh pleasure seeing you again well, we'll definitely do this again. And, uh, you know, good luck with, uh, you know, getting, you know, training camp uh, next week. I'm just, I'm excited for the hair to be ready just for, for the bright lights. So, uh, but uh, All right. thanks again, Kyle. That's great. I'll try not to disappoint you. <laughs>